Well, on, on behalf of us all, um, many thanks to the Minister for a powerful and important speech. Um, the speech was a strong and thoughtful personal statement, but also a speech by a minister in a government that has been good to universities and to research, including good to the arts and humanities, <clears throat> above all, creating the Arts and Humanities Research Council that I was proud to be able to bring into being before I left for Goldsmiths. But times are changing. Uh, David and I are both Tottenham supporters, and for a Tottenham supporter, the present is always a disappointment. <laughs> but we're always full of optimism for the coming season. I can't say that now as far as higher education is concerned. After a very good decade uh, for higher education, um, we're heading for difficult times. Difficult times for universities and for research as public funding comes under pressure. There's great danger at times such as that, that we might focus on narrow economic and short-term issues. That in times of hardship, luxuries are dispensed with. And there's a great fear that the arts and humanities might count as luxuries. But the arts and humanities are not luxuries, as the minister has just powerfully argued in his speech. And as the public has repeatedly shown in these hard times, Attendance at museums, galleries, and cultural spaces has risen in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and in France during the credit crunch and recession. And I find that hugely encouraging and also something that we need to think about and reflect upon. The minister's affirmation of the importance of the arts and humanities and of a liberal arts education is very timely, especially in the context of the creation of the new Department of Business, Innovation, and Skills. There were inevitable anxieties when that uh, was announced, that universities and research were moving into a business department, as if that was what universities and research were essentially about. The minister has argued powerfully against that interpretation, and in my response, I'd like to build on his reassuring speech. I want to start with his stress on the totality of knowledge. There's a very important insistence recur recurring through the speech um, on the fact that arts and humanities and the sciences were part of the same world, that we mustn't mount an instrumental argument for science and a more idealistic argument for the arts and humanities. He rightly insists that they all contribute to the richness of our society, to economic innovation, to the quality of graduates, to the strength of knowledge, to our ability for critical and thoughtful engagement, and that they interact with each other in so many ways. The wonder of science, and I speak as a historian, not as a scientist, the wonder of science is as breathtaking as some of the wonders of art. They're about the excitement of being human and of discovery. When I was chief executive of the Arts and Humanities Research Board, the chief executives of all the research councils would get together once every few months simply to, to discuss the science that went on, the research that went on in our areas. I still remember vividly Ian Halliday as chief executive of the Particle Physics and Astronomy Research Council, giving us a 15-minute talk about the search for gravitational waves, the astonishing, um, uh, the astonishing telescopes that were being built to seek to track down gravitational waves. There seemed no purpose to find that out, except that if they couldn't find them, then the laws of physics collapsed. But it didn't, it, there was no obvious outcome, sheer curiosity. And I felt so excited that at that moment, I said, take all the arts and humanities research budget. I, <laughs> I took, the, I, took, I took that point back, but nonetheless, the fact is, science is as exciting a part of human discovery as is what goes on in the arts and humanities. Science and the arts, therefore, have so much in common, but it doesn't always feel like that these days. So the minister's insistence on not dividing the power of knowledge is very important. He rejects seeing STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. He rejects seeing STEM and the arts and humanities as somehow occupying separate spheres. I'm currently reading a wonderful new novel by China Mieville called The City and the City. It's about two cities with different languages, different dress codes, different building styles, different cultures, but they occupy the same physical space. Some parts of the space are exclusive to one city or the other, but much of it is what is called cross-hatched. The same si two cities occupy the same streets and the same space, but people in one city have learned since childhood not to see the other. They unsee it, in the, in the term that Mieville uses. 
I think much of our approach to STEM and the arts and humanities does just that. We unsee each other, not understanding each other's language or culture, but we occupy the same space. We simply pretend that we don't. And my lesson from the minister's speech is that we need to wake up, acknowledge that academic disciplines occupy the same broad territory, that the city is one and that we all contribute to it. So we must stop thinking of STEM on the one hand and arts and humanities on the other. Then we would avoid the danger of seeing one as the essence and the other as a luxury. The speech made a powerful case <clears throat> for a liberal education for all. That it isn't employability skills or a broad education, that they're actually bound together. That what employers need is the ability to reflect, adapt, challenge and analyse that comes from a serious university education. And that simultaneously prepares people for an engaged democracy. That is one of the powerful messages that I took um, for, from the speech. In many ways, we've trapped ourselves within the language of skills. It's replaced education in so much of the discourse. And yet the minister's speech was really about education. He's given us back the rounded graduate, not the graduate as a bundle of skills, as if what you get at university is like what you got at level three, but the sums are harder. It's something radically different. UK universities give society people with imagination and flexibility who know their field and their techniques, but who are critical, engaged, imaginative, and flexible, and analytical. It certainly comes from a liberal arts education, but from my experience, it comes from university education well beyond just the liberal arts. It's what draws international employers to UK graduates, as the excellent work of the Council for Industry and Higher Education has shown time and again. We're educating people for jobs that haven't yet been invented. And employers need the breadth of graduates that the minister has described. If we ask media employers in the year 2000 what skills they needed, none of them would have mentioned interactive media. None of them would have mentioned digital content. But within five years, that is what they needed. And graduates from Goldsmiths and other top media departments adapted. They had the conceptual, analytical, liberal education to be flexible. It isn't just that society needs the broad education universities provide, so do employers if they'll look to the future. And this broad education is what creates the ability to challenge and to be creative. It emerges, emerges from a distinctive mode of learning, distinctive to British universities, based on close teaching and learning interactions. A recent report that I chaired on the costs of sustainable teaching showed that that distinctive education is under threat if resourcing issues for teaching are not thought about. We don't want the kind of graduate the minister describes to become less common in the future. And one reason for not wanting them to become less common is another major theme of the, of, of the talk, that liberal arts are a force for community cohesion, for democracy, and for citizenship. This is an impressive and important part of the speech. A new kind of community cohesion as the minister argued, that isn't attachment to a cultural canon, something that, was, that, 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 that it might have seemed 50 or 100 years ago, but an attachment to something that is changing and fluid. Indeed, what makes plays and books and music and film so powerful a unifying force is the fact that we bring to them our own cultural and personal resources. They're open to our own engagement and perception. That is the democratization of culture but democratization without homogenization. I imagine a good number of us have seen England people very nice at the National Theatre, which created real controversy. It wasn't a great play in my mind, but it made people engage and argue, not just about racial stereotyping, but about the very meaning of the play itself. The arts and humanities thrive off, they celebrate, they need complexity. They're about understanding the complexity of lives, of identities, of cultures, and that's why students have to argue over what they learn. And that's why the arts and humanities are so challenging and so important in helping us to create the basis for community cohesion, for social cohesion. When I was at the Arts and Humanities Research Board, we established a, a, a strategic theme on diasporas, migration, and identity. We explored just that complexity across time, across place, across ethnic groups. And it made us understand the way in which identities take shape. They helped with the challenges of security and cohesion. 
And it's no wonder that the chief scientist at the Home Office was and still is so enthusiastic about that arts and humanities work. The minister was rightly anxious to acknowledge, but not focus on, the economic benefits of the arts and humanities, lest he confirm some people's fears about the impact of his new department. But we all know the huge importance of the creative economy, that the creative industries rest on the UK's great competitive advantage, the knowledge it generates, in this case creative knowledge, and the talent of its graduates, in this case creative talents. I just want to note that the creative economy doesn't exist in an economic box. It needs vibrant artistic performance and cultural world. The creative industries need the imagination and the energy nurtured in the cultural sector. The very artistic vitality so rightly praised in the speech isn't just good for the liberal reflective society we all want, it's actually good for the economy too. Public and private are no longer a helpful division in the cultural sphere and they all feed off education and research in universities. In the latter part of the speech, uh, universities are asked to emulate museums and galleries, to spread their cultural and intellectual riches better. I wouldn't in any way dispute the importance of that. I agree with it. But I point out that much research in universities reaches the public through museums and galleries. The great exhi exhibitions in the British Museum, in the National Portrait Gallery, in the National Maritime Museum, in countless museums around the country, could not happen without university researchers in the arts and humanities. And of course, universities have their own museums and galleries, the best of them directly funded by, by, by Hefke. If we want to ensure that universities spread their cultural riches in this way, we must ensure that in tough times, that small funding stream to university museums and galleries is protected. And of course, the British Library is a fundamental part of all of this. It's a fundamental part of the research infrastructure for the arts and humanities and for much, much more right across that terrain of the arts, humanities and sciences um, that, that the minister drew our attention to. It's the source of brilliant dissemination to the public and to business. The British Library, with no dust that I'm aware of um, on its shelves, is one of the great cultural and research resources of the world. It's essential to the kind of society you're describing, minister. And all of this keeps leading me, finally, to research. The minister recognises government funding for research in the arts and humanities, and there's huge credit to this government for establishing and funding the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and for putting resources into the Hefke research funding scheme, stream. The imaginative and reflective graduates, the ideas of the creative industries, the work that drives our astonishing creative energy and cultural energy, the understanding of identities or cohesion or religion and so much more all rests on research in the arts and humanities. And the role of research in all that the minister describes needs to be stressed. So the decision to protect science and technology after the last RAE took money away from research in the arts and humanities. That was not helpful. And we need to work on these issues. We also need to work on the fact that knowledge transfer of research is based on science and technology models at the moment, which is again not friendly to the arts and humanities. We need to work with you, uh, Minister, on these issues, with you and your colleagues, if the real riches of what arts and humanities research can bring are to be harvested. David, you'd be disappointed if I merely applauded the speech, um, but I do applaud it. It's a powerful and thoughtful affirmation of a vision for universities, a vision for education, for research, for the breadth of their contribution to society. I hope my comments have enlarged on that vision. And if I find some gaps between that vision and some aspects of government policy, then you'd expect me to point them out. Um, because they underline, rather than detract from, the importance of this speech. The blurb that we all received inviting us said the minister would argue for, and I quote, higher learning for its own sake. Actually, he didn't use the words in the speech, and I'm pleased about that, because what this important speech has argued for is not higher learning for its own sake, but higher learning for all our sakes. Thank you.